Hello everyone, this is Joel Levin, Executive Director of Plugin America. Welcome to the Massachusetts Drive Clean Workplace Charging Webinar. Today, we'll be introducing you to the Massachusetts Drive Clean Workplace Charging Guide, which Plugin America published with assistance from the John Merck Fund. Many thanks to go to the John Merck Fund for their generous support. Also, I'd like to thank our colleagues and friends from Massachusetts and applaud them for their commitment to getting more electric vehicles and infrastructure deployed across the Commonwealth. I'm honored to introduce some key leaders from Massachusetts government and the business community, including special video remarks from Secretary Matthew Beaton. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Plug in America and our mission, as well as the largest EV party on the planet, which is scheduled for this September. Plug in America is a nonprofit organization which strives to educate people about electric vehicles. We serve as a voice for electric vehicle drivers. It's our mission to get everyone loving EVs just like we do. So one easy way to get people to love electric cars and to find out how much fun they are is by offering them a chance to ride in one or better yet, to drive one. That's why we partner with the Sierra Club and the Electric Auto Association to present National Drive Electric Week. This year, September 10th through the 18th, you can join more than 100,000 other EV enthusiasts, EV curious folks, and many others. So join us, come on out, enjoy some family fun, kick the tires, and celebrate EVs. Visit driveelectricweek.org to find an event near you and to learn more. Again, I'm honored to introduce these pre-recorded remarks from Matthew Beaton, Secretary, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The Commonwealth's Drive Clean program, strong support for innovation, and other extensive collaborations are having an incredible impact. Smart policies like these help clean the air and reduce greenhouse gas emissions throughout the region. But, as you'll hear from the Secretary, more needs to be done. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Beaton, and I have the honor of serving as Secretary of the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Massachusetts Workplace Charging Webinar. However, before I begin, I would first like to thank our co-host, Plug in America. Along with environmental advocates across the Commonwealth, Plug in America extends our ability to provide critical information to businesses and citizens on a wide range of environmental issues of key importance. I also want to recognize some of Massachusetts' early innovators and leaders in workplace charging. Jeff Hyman from EMD Serrano and Rory O. Mahoney from UMass Lowell. The Baker Polito administration is committed to electric vehicles and the advantages they provide consumers and the environment. Commissioner Marty Suberg at the Department of Environmental Protection and Commissioner Judith Judson at the Department of Energy Resources lead dedicated staffs who are working to support the increased deployment of electric vehicles. While the Commonwealth is making tremendous progress in integrating electric vehicles into our everyday lives, we need leaders like you to make commitments to help us continue our mission. In addition to the benefits for consumers, the Baker Polito administration supports a multifaceted approach to increasing electric vehicle use in the state because of the environmental benefits provided. Transportation is the number one contributor of greenhouse gas emissions in our state. Recognizing Massachusetts' efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the Baker Polito administration has implemented ZEV rebate programs designed initiatives encouraging the purchase and use of ZEVs, and joined seven states to coordinate ZEV adoption efforts. Through your continued support, these and other similar policies, when started now, will result in measurable GHG reductions for 2030 and 2050. Continued action to have additional electric vehicles on the road and in our transportation system is a key part of our state's clean energy and climate plan. Climate and transportation challenges and solutions know no borders. And we look forward to partnering with other states and stakeholders who share our combined mission. Coordination among seven states in the Northeast and West 
has led to an agreement to register 3.3 million plug-in and fuel cell electric vehicles. This sort of collaboration must and will continue. We have a long way to go. Our strategy to meet the goal of more electric vehicles on our roadways focuses with three key areas. Vehicles incentives, educational opportunities, and vehicle charging infrastructure. Through the implementation of our strategies, our goals are attainable. However, it will take your commitment to take action on behalf of your employees and to take a leadership role in the sustainability efforts of your company. Take advantage of this next hour. Listen to those who have learned practical lessons on how to construct a workplace charging program. Ask questions and don't hesitate to follow up with us in the future. Again, thank you for joining us today and for considering your role in this transportation revolution. Thank you so much to the Secretary and his staff for their leadership and for presenting today. Next, we'll hear from Christine Kirby. She's the Director, Air and Climate Programs, Bureau of Waste Prevention. She'll elaborate on Massachusetts' innovative incentive programs, its rideshare initiative, and she'll tell us how these efforts interconnect with electric vehicle infrastructure. Good afternoon, and thank you to Secretary Beaton, participants, and Plug in America for attending the Workplace Charging webinar. Employers play a critical role in offering mobility options to their employees. And going forward, employers can play a role in advancing electric vehicles through workplace charging. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts and MassDEP have been active in promoting plug-in vehicles on many fronts, through our regulations, incentive programs, and work with regional organizations to promote these vehicles. Secretary Beaton mentioned the goal under the eight state zero emission vehicle memorandum of understanding to have over 300,000 plug-in vehicles in mass by 2025. Electric vehicles are also a critical strategy to meet our Global Warming Solutions Act goals. These goals are a 25% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2020, by 2020 and 80% by 2050. A key part of the Massachusetts transportation electrification effort is to ensure that there is a robust charging network in the state and in the region. EV charging will happen at home, at public charging stations, and at the workplace. Today I will cover what Massachusetts and MassDEP has been doing to increase electric vehicle charging, particularly at workplaces. First, why workplace charging and why are we focused on it? Massachusetts has seen a large increase in the number of electric vehicles, tripling in the last three years. We now have over 7,000 registered in Massachusetts with this number growing monthly. Installing workplace charging is a sign of corporate leadership and innovation and demonstrates a willingness to promote a new clean technology. Providing workplace charging also reduces emissions from employee commutes. This is particularly important to facilities in Massachusetts subject to the rideshare regulation. It also enhances the employer's employee benefits packages and helps, to, helps the employer to recruit and retain employees. One interesting statistic is that the U.S. Department of Energy found that drivers were 20 times more likely to purchase a plug-in vehicle if there was workplace charging available. Next, I'm going to provide details on the Massachusetts Electric Vehicle Incentive Program, known as Mass EVIP, on particularly the Workplace Charging Program. This program was launched in 2014 with $1.4 million in penalty funds set aside for the program. Mass EVIP Workplace Charging Program specifics include the following. We provide 50% of the hardware costs for electric vehicle charging stations. Note that we do not cover the costs for installation, software, taxes, and shipping charges. Eligible entities are non-residential places of business. Entities must employ 15 or more persons. And charging stations must be able to um, charge multiple manufacturer vehicles. And finally, only level one or level two charging stations are eligible. To date, Mass Event Workplace Charging has awarded funding for 405 charging stations at 203 separate street locations. 
And through the end of June, we have installed 291 charging stations at 148 separate street locations. In terms of the workplace charging program application process, application period is on a first come, first serve basis. You must complete and submit to MassDEP an application form found on the program webpage, which is on the slides. Applications are reviewed and MassDEP will issue a grant approval within 30 days, usually sooner, um, after we received, received the application. Entities must sign an end user agreement. This is a contract that lays out the terms and conditions for use of the funding. The main requirements for end user agreements are one, commit to having the charging station operational in the Commonwealth for at least 36 months. MassDEP may also request access to view the charging stations. MassDEP may request usage data for the charging stations. And the charging station must have reserved parking spots, which are marked clearly for EV only. And enforcement must be, excuse me, enforcement must be available to move a non-EV. Upon receipt of the signed end user agreement by MassDEP, an entity has 180 days to acquire and install the charging stations. And once a charging station or charging stations are installed and operational, the participant submits a payment request form completed and signed by both the participant and charging station vendor, the invoice for the charging stations, invoices for charging stations installation, photos of the charging stations, and then upon receipt of completed payment requests, payment will be sent by MassDEP or the, um, the entity issuing checks within 45 to 60 days. I also wanted to provide a quick overview of our other Mass EVIP program, which applies to fleets. Mass EVIP is, open, is an open incentive program administered also by MassDEP that is providing incentives to municipal and state fleets, colleges and universities to acquire electric vehicles and install level two dual head charging stations. Some employers on the call today may also be eligible for this program. Over the last three years, Mass EVIP Fleets Program has awarded over $1.8 million to 52 entities for 185 electric vehicles. This includes 144 full battery electric vehicles, 41 plug-in hybrid vehicles, and one zero emission motorcycle, and 582,000 in financial assistance, assistance has been provided for workplace, excuse me, charging stations. Again, the, the program webpage is on the slides. In conclusion, again, Thanks for attending this seminar. I want to recognize Sajal Shah on the Mass DEP uh, Workplace Charging and Fleets Program for Mass EVIP. Her phone number is 617-556-1015. Her email is sejal.shah at state.ma.us. And finally, if any entities are in interested in hosting a ride and drive event in Massachusetts, please log on to massdriveclean.org, and that's M-A-S-S-D-R-I-V-E dot C-L-E-A-N dot org. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Kirby. We appreciate your time to be with us today. So next up, we have Barry Woods. Barry serves as the secretary uh, of the Plug-in America Board of Directors. He led the effort to produce the Massachusetts Drive Clean Workplace Charging Guide, uh, which he's going to be uh, going through for us today. He's a practicing attorney and an EVSC consultant uh, for the past six years, first in the Pacific Northwest and now in New England. Uh, Barry has been on a mission to accelerate deployment of electric vehicles and charging station infrastructure. He is uh, the organizer of Drive Electric Maine, a group of Maine's most engaged public and private stakeholders in developing Maine's EV resources. So welcome, Barry. Thank you very much, Joel. Uh, I appreciate your introduction. Um, and I, I wish I had my Boston accent, but I lost it somewhere probably in the Pacific Northwest. But I am in the Northeast, so that hopefully, uh, hopefully adds a, a useful perspective here. Um, 
before I begin talking further about the resource guide, and there's a lot of terrain to cover, I just wanted to add that there's a, to Christine's comments about state-based incentives, it's good to remember from an, from an employer perspective that there's also a federal tax credit that allows a 30% dollar-for-dollar uh, dollar reduction uh, for the end of, through the end of this year for both installation and hardware, and that's not double dipping. So but between the state of Massachusetts and the Fed, that's a pretty aggressive combination of savings that employers can uh, experience. But anyway, to get back to the back on track with the guide, um, Plug in America uh, really feels that workplace charging is a critical area to foster awareness and uh, and to help uh, employers in particular begin the process of electrifying um, their parking uh, parking spaces. I mean, it's the longest dwell time for cars parking next to being at a residence. And it also is interesting because particularly in high urban, high density urban areas, it also is potentially the partial answer for folks who don't otherwise have easy access to charging on their own when they're when they're at home. So it fulfills a variety of uh, a variety of roles, um, and uh, that's one reason why we felt it was really important to provide um, the opportunity to talk about it. So the guide, as you can see, the guide contents um, are fairly involved, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time kind of going through each various area. I'd rather hit the, the areas that I think are the most often questioned. But I certainly urge you to go in and, and read the guide, which you'll see there'll be some links to uh, how you can find it going forward. Um, I think it's also important to think about the fact that even with the fleet, the current availability of plug-in electric vehicles and what their what their range potentials are, that it's still quite feasible for most people to, to find a vehicle that will work for their particular individual commute. In fact, one of the most recent data points that I that I came across is that mass commuters average about 33 miles round trip. Uh, to and from work, and you can clearly see when you start looking at the vehicles, whether it's the all-battery electrics or the plug-in hybrid electrics that have some gas on board, there's vehicles out there right now um, that clearly can um, provide the benefits uh, for, for commuters. So the guidebook is structured to really provide substance and process necessary for an employer to get going. Um, and one reason why we think it's important is that we're, as a nonprofit, um, consumer user-based advocacy group. Um, you know, we're passionate about making this technology successful, but at the same time, we try to feel like we have an impartial perspective on how to set this up and, and not to be slanted necessarily one way or the other relative to, to uh, the technologies that are out there. I think there's a lot of noise out there, and I think hopefully we'll add some perspective um, that will be helpful to you. And you'll also see the terrain is changing. Um, so, so anyway, to to go to the to go to the next slide, I, I was going to suggest that um, Massachusetts wait for the next slide. MK, uh, sorry. So this this is the slide. Thanks. Um, one 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 thing to be aware of. Um, this is certainly not unique to Massachusetts, but um, uh, this is a picture taken at eight o'clock in the morning at the Natick Mall on Thursday, March thirty first. Which for those of you who um, uh, have a, a particular uh, interest in this is when the Tesla 3 uh, was able to be pre-registered at the stores to get in line of pref to get preferential treatment in the uh, in the queue from the from Tesla in terms of delivery and this is uh, this shows that there were about 75 people in line that day and it was um, at 8 in the morning and obviously that line extended out quite a bit longer and, and one reason why this is important is this is really the beginning of the next generation of battery electrics which Massachusetts will be a beneficiary of as a, as a zero emission vehicle state. And, and it's, it's providing the consumer with a really, um, I think, substantial range vehicle at a, at a price point that meets what the average vehicle uh, is that's out there. And so this gets a 200 mile plus range. It's going to be priced to have for incentives at about 30,000, or at least that's what their the avowed price is. And in the first month alone, 400,000 of these vehicles were pre-registered um, by Tesla. So 400,000 people put $1,000 down for a vehicle that does not yet really exist. And uh, just to give you some perspective, uh, you know, the Camry, the best-selling car in the United States for the year, sold less than that number. So this is a very interesting time to be involved in the industry. And Tesla's not the only one, obviously, who's, who's putting a lot of emphasis 
um, in the technology. Uh, GM has got a similar vehicle with, in the Bolt with a B that's going to be coming out at the end of this year with 200 miles range, same price point. Um, Nissan Leaf is talking about similar range enhancements. Ford is putting $4.3 billion of uh, research and development. So it's, you know, it's a critical time in the industry, and it's, and it's clearly uh, an exciting time. Um, and we at, we at Plug in America see this is really representative of pent-up demand. So when we're talking about what the goals of the chart of the resource guide are, I mean, I think uh, obviously it's important to, to bear in mind that the state has a, a goal of putting 300,000 of these vehicles on the road by 2025. And between that goal, the incentives of the state, and what we're seeing with the manufacturers, it's really important, I think, that employers start responding to this now and start planning. So when I think about some of the critical areas to be thinking about for workplace charging, the mix of vehicle types out there um, are really uh, require uh, somewhat different approaches. And so the one-size-fits-all approach is probably not a useful expenditure of money. Uh, each vehicle really has different charging needs, um, whether it's a plug-in hybrid electric like the Volt or an all-battery electric, even with ranges that, that are going to be enhanced. And so when you're thinking about putting in chargers, be thinking about installing a mix of level one and level two charging stations um, to be the most strategic uh, in response to those fleets. Um, it's important to remember level one is basically a 120 volt you know, everyday outlet capacity goes 15 to 25 amps, and, and level two is goes up to typically goes to about 40 amps, like a dryer, um, but can charge at two to three times the speed of level one. And so, those are a mix of those resources. I think will be important for for employers to be thinking about when they're when they're looking at their their budget, what their electrical needs are, and just what their facility resources are. The other thing to think about in this, terms of this guide is to think about the charging technology and how you can get chargers that go from fairly basic features and inexpensive prices up to very, very um, uh, sophisticated uh, touchscreen oriented smart chargers. And so it, it behooves the host to really think ahead of time about what is it that they really want in terms of functionality. Um, because those investment levels are fairly significant um, you know, differences in the hardware. And also, how do they intend to manage their, their charging clusters? And at the same time, notwithstanding the need to put this, some of these chargers in place now, pace, the pace of innovation and change is still very rapid. And so what's, what's relevant today, five years from now, may not be quite as relevant as, as the vehicles change and as the density changes. So I think it's important to be thinking you know, as much as possible about where, these are, where, the, where this is going to evolve. And so as a result of that, Plug in America really wants people to be thinking more carefully about investing in low-cost equipment, particularly with emphasizing level one charging, where cars are going to be at locations for four or more hours. Um, I think uh, people underestimate the, uh, you know, the fact that level one is a very uh, ubiquitous, inexpensive form of uh, charging opportunity, and, uh, and, and employers shouldn't underestimate their, their ability uh, to leverage their level one resources to, to meet the need for uh, a lot of different vehicles. So if we go to the next slide, that'd be great. So that another very common question is, should I bill for electricity? And one of the things that we've found is that right now the uh, U.S. Department of Energy has some data that shows about 80% of employers currently provide it free as, as a, on, a, on a complimentary basis, which I think initially at low concentrations of vehicles makes a lot of sense as a form of incentivizing and getting people to look at the technology. But obviously, if you see what's going on in California, we find that there's greater and greater competition for a limited resource. And, and when that happens, we have to start thinking about how do we control um, the usage uh, in, in a fair manner. So we've come up with the Goldilocks um, approach, the just right approach, which is elaborated on in more detail on the blog. Um, by Tom Saxton on our, uh, again, our Plug in America. But the, the gist of it is that we really think that it is in the benefit, to the benefit of the employers and the employees using the resource to provide a little bit over uh, market rate char uh, uh, charging for the, the cost of electricity. People who, who own these vehicles know pretty clearly what the residential rates are since they use them, they charge at home uh, quite frequently. And they don't want to be gouged you know, by their employer. Um, and in fact, 
there's a lot of evidence that suggests if employers are overly aggressive in their in their uh, uh, cost, their pricing, it actually can disincentivize charging, which really is not a good thing. So putting putting some kind of cost is good, but making it a little bit above um, market value controls, I think, uh, uh, the use. And it also avoids the appearance of creating an, a benefit that's um, socially inequitable from other folks who are using other types of uh, combustion engine vehicles. So it really, uh, as a matter of fairness and also as a matter of keeping things um, uh, used properly, putting some kind of cost associated with the electricity in the long run is probably a good thing. Next. And then the other common question is, what should we do about installation to keep the cost down? Because a lot of times, given the value, given the cost of the hardware for level one and level two, which can be fairly modest, the installation cost can actually be fairly substantial, and so we want to look at the um, we want to look at the, the location as a critical component of the overall um, cost of providing charging, and thinking about providing dedicated expandable locations for charging spaces is one of the critical formula. Choosing um, landscape that's uh, you don't have to trench or bore through like uh, is, a, is, a, is a better choice when possible. So softscape is what we call that, um, over hardscape. Hardscape can cost up to $100 per foot if you have to trench through um, existing asphalt and run conduit and patch, and so it can get expensive fast. The other thing is signage is really important. People need to be able to find the uh, where the charging is and also to prevent people from parking there who aren't using the, using the charging as a resource. Um, locating it close to existing electrical um, panels also will eliminate the cost of um, the installation. Sometimes you can do that by simple wall mounts of the hardware. Other times you have to invest a little bit more in the hardware up front in terms of providing pedestals, which can be sited uh, more flexibly um, towards the uh, where the available um, panels are, electric, electrical panels. The other thing that people underestimate um, the value of is long cord sets. Um, we find that, uh, for example, for level two, chargers that are using the 40 amps, um, you know, it's best to site those where they can access two or more dedicated charging spaces so that when people are done um, charging, which can happen because they're faster, you know, within two to three hours, the, the, the car doesn't need to be moved. You just need to disconnect the cord and plug it into the car next door. And so getting car, getting chargers that have longer cords is actually a virtue and, and, and it greatly increases accessibility. Um, similarly, as I've said, level one is a great opportunity to provide inexpensive hardware um, and save on electricity while also meeting for the meeting the demand for for charging. Thank you. Next slide. And then I think another critical area is behavior, um, which in New England, obviously, you know, we're not quite there in terms of uh, EV density, but we are starting to see signs of this in California. And so I think the basic premise to think about is, you know, the fact that it's a limited resource. And if it's limited, you have to figure out ways to provide ample consideration for everybody to use it and, and in a fair manner. And so, you know, designating the parking spaces through proper signage is, is critical. Um, making clear that it's um, intended to be for, um, you know, necessity, uh, not convenience, um, is, is obviously a critical part of it. Um, uh, and people don't unplug other people unless they're absolutely certain that it's okay to do that. And there's a number of ways of confirming, you know, how long people need to charge. Um, every every driver of a, of a plug-in vehicle ought to register with their employer uh, so that the employer knows what the you know the demand is and can anticipate expansion, um, as well as facilitate communication to all the relevant users. Um, and obviously, when you're done charging, make it available to other people. Um, and if you don't need to charge uh, at work, maybe you should consider not charging and leaving it available to other people. Um, and, and lastly, I think uh, providing some kind of consequence for people that abuse the privilege is probably a reasonable thing to do. Um, I tend to think most EV drivers are pretty considerate of one another, but you know, as, as density uh, increases, uh, anybody who's been in Massachusetts traffic knows that uh, we're nice people. Uh, but density does cause unusual behaviors, and I think uh, you know that's particularly true. I think in charging, and we're starting to see some of this in California. So there's an appendices in the guide that talks about a, a policy that is a model policy, and you'll hear from some of the case studies coming up 
you know, how some of the other institutions use it. So anyway, there's a lot of opportunity to learn from other employers about how to create a policy. Um, lastly, last slide. So lastly, just uh, I think it's important to use the guide, uh, take it, take it, and take what you need and leave the rest. Um, we like the idea of creating a charging team to help with decision making up front before we start making investments in the hardware at the uh, process. One size does not fit all. We like a mix of level one for uh, plug-in hybrid electrics that don't tend to charge as fast uh, versus level two for battery electrics, which have larger batteries and, and by necessity require electricity. Um, we like the idea of thinking carefully about your technology choice functionality. Do you need to have energy data management systems? Do you need to have access control? Can you get away with you know, not having a network system? Or do you need a network system if you're, you know, I mean, these are all important questions that the guide will hopefully provide some light on, shine some light on. Should you charge for electricity? Um, you should definitely provide dedicated parking with signage um, and, and choosing spaces carefully uh, minimizes the cost, getting a policy in place, and then lastly, monitoring the use to determine when to expand and accessorize for added functionality as the density increases. These are all, I think, elements that hopefully the guide will help you think about as you design your own program. So uh, anyway, this is just a teaser for the guide. I hope you uh, download it, look at it. If you have questions for improving it or otherwise, let us know. We appreciate the chance to talk to you about uh, how important workplace charging is in Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. So next we're going to hear some specifics from two groups who have deployed infrastructure at their workplaces. Um, our first case study comes from the Associate Director of Sustainability at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, uh, Rory O. Mahoney. So thank you very much for being with us today, Rory. Great, thanks, Joe. You, you can hear me okay, right? Yes, I hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so I, I think Barry's intro was a, was a great um, way to introduce the, you know, the case study specifics here. Um, but just to give you guys a quick overview of, of UMass Lowell, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with it. But over the last um, you know 10 years or so, UMass Lowell has gone through, you know, quite frankly, an amazing transformation. And um, so we've shifted from primarily a commuter school um, to almost a 50-50 split between commuters and residence students. Um, as of um, last year, our enrollment was. 17,500. We are on track to hit 20,000 students um, by FY19. So it really has been a huge transformation at the university. Along with the physical size of campus, the reputation for UMass Lowell has grown significantly. And I think a, a really you know key strength of our program here ha has been um, and continues to be that sustainability is a key focus as we continue to grow. So that sustainability focus is informed through key documents such as our 2020 strategic plan or climate action plan and the newly formed Office of Sustainability. Our office here um, has been in existence for less than a year and um, so it's a real statement of intent from our university's leadership about the importance of growing but growing sustainably. So this slide will give you a snapshot of UMass Lowell in 2007. If we uh, go to the next slide. This will give you an idea of how the university has grown. So you can see that there's a significant increase in new buildings, renovated buildings. Um, I believe uh, since 2007, the university has increased physically by 24%. Our enrollment is up 18%. At the same time, our greenhouse gas emissions are down over 15%. So this isn't this isn't this commitment to sustainability isn't something that's you know just talked about in documents and it's nice to put you know out there as, as something that the university is doing. It's something that we're living here every day, and I think the university is making great strides in, in achieving our sustainability goals. The so next slide. So here, here's an example of what I just mentioned. Um, again, you know, that focus on sustainability informs everything that we do here at UMass Lowell. Next slide. So as I mentioned, you know, we do have a climate action plan, um, similar to many of the, the state universities here, and I know that some of our partner universities at UMass um, have a big focus on our climate action plan. 
But one thing that's very noticeable with our greenhouse gas emissions, and I feel it's replicated statewide and, and nationally, is that one of our biggest contributors to our greenhouse gas emissions is transportation. So when we did our first climate action plan, over one third of our greenhouse gas emissions were transportation related. So obviously EV charging isn't going to solve um, that, that large amount of emissions, but it certainly is part of a multifaceted approach that we take to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions as to relate to transportation. So a quick overview of how we got started here. Um, so about a year ago, maybe 18 months ago, um, we reached out to um, MassDEP um, to, to inquire about what was available for incentives. And I know that Christine had mentioned it in her opening remarks, but I cannot you know, speak um, highly enough of, of CJAL and the team at MassDEP. They were a phenomenal resource for us. In all honesty, I and a lot of people here knew nothing about EV charging um, when we started on this journey and the resources that we had available from the state staff was hugely, hugely beneficial to us. So if anybody is considering looking at um, installing EV stations, please re reach out to the team there. They've been phenomenal to us and, and really, really great resource for everybody. Um, so we took advantage of a Mass DEP workplace charging grant. What that entailed was we um, installed um, three level two charging stations in each of our main parking garages on campus. So the location of the EV stations I think was critically important. I know that Barry had mentioned um, that location is key here. So we put them in prime parking spots um, at, at the very entrance to our garages and we, we reinforced that with very, very clear and distinct pavement markings and wayfinding signage to make sure that pe people were aware of what was actually here on campus. Um, in addition, once we had the stations installed and operational, we worked hard with our team here at University's Rela University Relations to develop a marketing plan to make the campus and the wider community aware that this resource now existed at UMass Lowell. Next slide. So when we did consider installing EV stations, the initial um, driving force behind this was that a number of our faculty members here were existing EV drivers. So we knew that we had um, a small captive market already. So that was a good incentive for, for us to move forward with this. So to give you an idea of the progress that we've made over the last year, our first set of charging stations became operational in May of 2015. And in that first month, we had 60 combined hours of EV charging. Um, just this past May, so May 2016, we're up to over 180 hours plus. So that's an enormous amount of growth. And I think a lot of that is due to the program awareness that came from that messaging campaign that we did in partnership with our team at University Relations. So one thing that I wanted to point out, and I, I know it's timely because I guess uh, Linda and the staff at DOER and DEP are looking for host sites um, for the um, Mass Drive Clean event. We did one of these events last year. It was hugely, hugely successful for us. So we had a number of different vehicle manufacturers on campus and gave people who were interested the opportunity to come inspect the vehicles, take them for a test drive. But I think what was really important as well is that the, there were staff there from the More EV program um, you know, talking about the incentives that are available. And it was hugely, hugely beneficial for us. We were able to capture the incoming students. We were able to make it available to staff and faculty. And I know that we've seen a big up, uptick in EV um, ownership and usage on campus as a result of that event. So I would encourage anybody who's considering installing EV stations or just learning more about it to reach out to Linda and her team um, because this really was a phenomenal event for us and, and certainly set the stage for the continued growth that we've had with EV charging at UMass Lowell. Next slide. So a couple of the lessons learned, and I think this one is critically important. I know that Barry had touched upon um, the infrastructure costs that come with this. We've been fortunate as, as we've gone through a period of you know, pretty immense physical expansion here. We've been able to tie in a lot of the um, expensive uh, infrastructure work that's associated with EV charging with existing projects. So this slide that's up right now, you can see University Crossing, which is our new student hub that effectively knits our different locations on campus together. 
with the two circular cross-hatched areas. Um, they're two areas that we installed EV stations after our initial stations were installed in our parking garage. So we were able to get the conduit laid for this. We were able to get the um, extra electrical capacity installed all as part of this um, university crossing project. So it certainly reduced um, our out-of-pocket costs for this and made the installation process a lot more palatable to university leadership. Next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, with any future capital projects here, the, the image at the bottom of the slide, that's our new business school that's going up on North Campus. And um, we have those capital projects installed the conduit with an electrical capacity. It's beneficial for our program here with the Office of Sustainability, but it also gets these new projects lead points, which I think is very important. Um, any you know state um, capital projects, um, new construction like this, there's a mandate that we follow the lead requirements and this um, ability to tie in the EV charging infrastructure is an added incentive that benefits both parties. Um, it really is efficient and uh, you know I, I have to say the fact that the cost for install, a lot of it isn't coming out of our budget is, is very welcome on our end as well. Next slide. So you know one thing that I, I, I wasn't aware of when we started this, um, the state contract pricing that's offered, that guarantees your, your, your state pricing for the um, actual EV stations themselves. One thing to be aware of is that if you want to access um, the reporting requirements with the EV station, we use ChargePoint and they have a really nice, you know, slick operating um, software that goes along with, this, with the hardware. There is a cost associated with that, so that's something to be aware of and, you know, we, we can share um, the, the different costs for the software packages, but that's certainly something to be aware of. When we installed our first EV stations, we obviously had to go through competitive bid. There was enormous variation um, from the, the, the different vendors that we saw there. So if you're considering this, I would encourage you to shop around. I think you can save a lot of money there. And you know, it's, it, it's some people kind of you know get overwhelmed by this as a relatively new technology. It's simple ele electrical work. So the more you shop around, I think the more uh, the more bang for your buck that you're going to get. And when we started doing this, we had all of our staff here in the Office of Sustainability go through the ChargePoint installer certification. Um, as you know, with any piece of hardware, you're going to have issues in terms of support. So this has been extremely beneficial to us. When any issues come up, you know, we're able to run out to the unit itself, reset it, you know, do any of the kind of uh, work that we need to do to get it back up and running. It's, I think, you know, maybe four or five hours from ChargePoint, but extremely beneficial um, to go through that that training as well. So I think that's that's it from me, um, you know, but I cannot reiterate enough the importance of working with the, the staff at DEP and DOR. They've been phenomenal to our program here, and I think it's given us a lot of resources that we've been able to continually add to our EV charging infrastructure and make it a key feature of our sustainability program here at UMass Lowell. Thank you very much, Rory. Uh, so we'll wrap up uh, the presentation today with Jeff Hyman. Jeff is the Senior Manager for Environment, Health, and Safety for the United States at EMD Serono. Uh, he's going to cover some successes and lessons learned from his company's workplace charging installation project. So uh, go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, Joel, and good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to share some lessons learned uh, with you today about our program and hope to you can take away a couple of tidbits. It, really, it's a summary of what you, you've already heard. And, um, I'd like to just quickly tell you a little bit about our company. Uh, EMD Serono is the biopharmaceutical business of Merck KGA in Germany. We operate as EMD Serono in the U.S. and globally as Merck. So we're founded in 1668. We have over 50,000 employees and about 5,000 employees in Massachusetts. So our reach uh, to uh, the opportunities with electric vehicle charging is, is there. And as a healthcare company division, we really do connect ourselves to the environment um, and helping our patients in, in that. So what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about workplace charging at EMD Serono, and just give you uh, a little bit about um, our story. It all, became, it all began with a conversation with our first uh, plug-in electric vehicle owner. We had an owner that purchased a Chevy Volt and said, We'd like to, I'd like to be able to connect that up and charge it at work. What do you think? And I did look into the program. 
And basically, the program is run by facilities and, and the EHS department. And that's one thing to keep in mind is who is going to run the process, and that's something that you'll take a look at. We decided to install level two charging uh, at two campus locations. We added a dual charging station at a, a location in 2015. What we believe that's important with stations is they do need to be simple. So clearly with level one charging, real simple power supply. With, with the level two capability that we chose, you have a little bit more about metrics. You can customize whether, how, how charging takes place, uh, whether you charge uh, a fee to a user or reporting requirements functionality. So it's important. We did take advantage of the state incentive in 2015. When we first installed these, it was 2012, early on, and we worked with our own contractors. But we also found it extremely beneficial uh, when we went to the charge point setup and we worked with our own contra uh, with their contractors for site work, conduit runs, and electrical and signage. So you, c you really need to choose whether you have the capability of doing it on your own with your own folks or whether you need to uh, work with a turnkey approach. Next slide. So we look at some program success factors. Um, we believe it's super, it was, it was really important for us to have support and approval by senior leadership. That, that was really key for us in order to have the, the program move forward. And you will need to have senior leadership approval to help build your program as well. Employee engagement has been high. And we, we usually say build it and they will come. Once we installed stations at our two campus locations in Massachusetts, automatically people started looking at electric cars. And we're now, we, we've now had a steady increase in now about 10, 10 vehicle owners that drive electric vehicles. Our, we believe that, and I'm going to talk about costs, but the, the operating costs are really reasonable. Uh, the benefits reduce carbon emissions. You know from our employees driving electric vehicles. Combined, if you, if you have carpooling with electric vehicles, even further reductions in, in, in greenhouse gas emissions. Obviously, there's some public relations benefits. And, and I really would like to say that this really opens the door to the technology and a green economy and really being a part of the solution. So I think it's really nice. Employee attraction and retention, I put a question mark. You'd be surprised uh, with different generations and, and the working the workforce. Uh, it, it can be a really important decision maker for somebody. Uh, we're a biotech company. There's lots of competition. There may be a number of reasons why somebody uh, might choose to work in our location, which is the suburbs. And obviously, the ultimate goal for me and most that know me know is helping to reach a, a lofty goal by 2025. Quickly on the numbers, real simple, uh, real numbers. We about nineteen thousand dollars to install uh, at, at our location, in uh, one of our locations. Employees who drive electric vehicles is now up to ten. We do not charge for users right now. Uh, it is free. That will change in the future when the affordable two hundred mile range vehicles, because that's a game changer. You'll have more people, so we'll have to change that philosophy a little bit. Our average monthly cost is about $200 a month. That's electricity and that's system data management because we have a metric system. So I would consider that to be pretty reasonable and certainly in our organization. Our organization. Next slide. And really lessons learned, and you've heard some of this, you want to locate charging stations for optimal cable access. We call it move cables, not cars. So you take a look at the photograph, you can see two cars parked at a charging station. If this were installed at a median where you could have cars parked uh, opposing this, you could then charge four cars here or more, so thereby moving the cables a little bit easier than having to move cars. Locating a charging station nearest the electrical source will certainly reduce cost. The greatest cost, in, in, in my opinion, is, is bringing infrastructure of electrical source to the charging station. So as close as you can make that, the better. Obviously, you heard about branding the program making it visible, promoting. You can see the signage. You can see the, the, the spaces are painted and wayfinding so that people can find it. The incentive originally was to, was to get people to buy, get electrics, and then be close to a building egress point. That isn't always important. So preferred parking you know, makes other people say, hey, how come I can't have a special space? 
And my answer is usually you can you can do that. Just get an electric car. Um, plug in plug in of vehicle owners are pretty pretty nice people at the moment, and they just need charging. So plan for the future. You, you've heard it before on the call. You need to size the conduit and electric, elect, additional electrical support because you will probably look to expand. And institute, a, uh, you're going to need a charging policy. I have a policy that I'm happy to share. Uh, I can share that through the team here and to send out to people. And communicate to people that it, things may be free now if it's free to start. Uh, it may not be free to ever. And a turnkey solution certainly worked well for us uh, at EMD Serrano. And that's it for me. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so before we get to viewer questions, uh, I wanted to wrap up with uh, a couple of thank yous. Uh, so first, uh, obviously, thank you very much to the John Merck Fund for providing the financial support and guidance that made this report possible. Uh, the report uh, directly supports Massachusetts' efforts and vision and leadership in promoting vehicle electrification and transitioning its transportation sector away from fossil fuels. Uh, while the, the views reflected in the guide are exclusively those of Plug in America, we want to thank some folks for their ongoing support and insight, uh, some of whom helped put together today's webinar. So thank you to, first of all, uh, Linda Benavides from the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, uh, Stephen Russell, the Clean, Sydney, Clean Cities Co-Coordinator for the Massachusetts Clean Cities Coalition, um, Sejal Shaw, uh, Environmental Analyst for Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, uh, Frank Marino, Senior Corporate Environmental Health and Services Manager for Raytheon Company, and Mark Foster, Manager of Security and Safety at Tufts Health Plan. So now for questions. Um, Plug in America Program Manager Mary Catherine Campbell has been collecting questions throughout the presentation. Um, so if you, additional people have questions, please type them uh, in the little question box. And uh, Mary Catherine will help us to uh, convey the questions to the panelists. So MK, go for it. Thanks, Joel, and thanks everybody for being on the call today. Um, the first question has been repeated a few times, and I think I'll direct it to Barry. Uh, uh, the question is, how do you charge fairly for employees to be able to park and charge at work? Thanks, MK. Um, so if I understand the question, it's, it may be more relating to the rate of uh, the, the rate payer, you know, rate for per kilowatt, which how do you charge fairly? I think you um, you look at what your prevailing rate is, and then you tag uh, some additional fee. Which you know, there's not a science to this. There's probably an art. I think you have to look at you know um, you know what what the current rate is, and then maybe add 20% and play with that number. You know, it's going to come down to behavior validating your, you know, your uh, uh, cost uh, decision on that, you know. So I think there's going to be trial and error. I don't think nationally there's any particular standard to this. Um, I know that some stations in very dense urban areas that have, you know, uh, a lot of competition can obviously get away with a higher rate. I think it's probably better for employers to try to behave conservatively to recover the cost of the electricity with a small premium on top of that to maybe offset the initial hardware installation costs. Um, but again, I think there's a line there that you'll notice an immediate drop off if you charge excessively. Thanks, Barry. There's a kind of little bit of a follow up to that question um, related to level one charging. How do you accurately determine what kind of cost you're you're going to be um, having to cover when it comes to uh, distributing those costs among people who are parking using level one charging. Yeah, so there is a difference in electricity consumption between level one and level two, and it can be pronounced because level two theoretically can go up to 100 amp size. So you're looking at the difference in an hour's period of 20 kilowatts potentially being fed by, by 100 amp level two versus 1.4 kilowatts 
for a for a level one. So is it fair to have both of those parties pay the same amount? No, because the electricity consumption rate is quite significant. But I do think that you can come up with a system that um, you know that, that looks at the different levels and assesses the proper charging based on kilowatt um, consumption, either by submetering, getting an inexpensive submeter that you can. You can connect a number of stations together. Uh, there's some relatively sophisticated providers out there. Um, I won't get into vendors, but they're you know you can you can aggregate up to 12 of these basic units now on the same submeter and dig and and through the cloud display what the actual usage is and consumption is. And then you know based on your monthly experience, you know you can bill each user, you know uh, accordingly. Level one, I think, is going to be more of a dedicated charging space arrangement. In other words, if you're using level one, you're probably going to get assigned that space, in which case the monthly fee will be consistent over time based on the average electricity consumption. So I don't think I'd overthink that too much, um, but I think it's good to be aware of the differences in electricity consumption between the two levels and try to adjust your, your uh, billing accordingly. That's great. Thanks, Barry. Um, another question specifically for Jeff. Uh, um, this question is asking how did the what did the nineteen thousand dollar cost that you published cover exactly? How many stations did you install, and what level charging did you use? Sure, MK. Um, so the nineteen thousand dollars covered the cost of a dual charging station. So basically, pictured as one one unit, but with two cables. What's included in that? was a fairly long trench and conduit run, an electrical connection, probably over 1,000 feet or more, 1,500 feet. So our source of electricity to where we placed the parking was fairly far away. The cost of the charging station itself is, is extremely reasonable, and certainly with the incentive from the state, even better. But so that's really where the, that's where I said, if you can, if you can cite your parking closest on your on your site to the electrical source. For example, you might find that power is is readily accessible in a parking garage, which we don't have. But that if you can find that power closer, you're going to reduce the cost. So every foot that you run of trench, conduit run, and electrical wire, and all the labor to run that, that's what that that cost could have been cut in half, certainly even more if we were closer. That's really it. That that's soup to nuts connection to the equipment, the equipment itself, and the labor and the materials. Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm wondering if if um, Rory would like to elaborate on the grants that he was able to use to install charging at U UMass Lowell. Um, a couple of people are asking how that kind of plays into what you were able to invest from the university's perspective? Yeah, that, absolutely. Um, so the first the first grant that I mentioned was the workplace charging grant, which, which covers 50% of the cost of the um, EV station itself. So that was the first grant that we got. Um, you know, there are some real incentives there um, and it, it saves you considerable funding. Uh, the second series of grants uh, that we had applied for was again under uh, Mass EVIP. Um, but we went for the fleet funding this time. So uh, we actually acquired a 2015 Nissan Leaf, um, and with that we got an EV station with it. So the way that that um, incentive is, is set up is that you get $7,500 uh, for the vehicle and then another $7,500 for the station itself. So we were able to apply um, you know, the $7,500 uh, to the Nissan Leaf and which after you know additional incentives from the manufacturer and um, federal incentives you know significantly reduced the cost for us and um, the 7500 for the station you know it's a it's a big chunk of funding to put towards the station itself after we purchased the station i think the, the price is about 6300 on state contract pricing we were able to use the remaining 1200 dollars or so to go towards the installation so there's two distinct uh, pots of funding, well, you know, programs there from the, from the state 
And again, you know, like I said last year, I knew nothing about this. Uh, CGL from the state and Linda are available to, to walk anybody through the specifics of this and make it as easy as possible. That's wonderful. Thank you, Rory. Um, one last question, and then we're going to have to wrap up because it's already 10 o'clock on the East Coast, or on the West Coast, excuse me, 1 o'clock out East. Um, could Jeff or Barry discuss any cases where employers wired for level two but chargers charged at level one? Um, our thought is that uh, wire once for level two, which can support level one, but this allows customers to, charge to change to a higher level um, EV as drivers need it. Um, any thoughts about cables in the ground too? 25 foot cables can be a tripping hazard. Uh, Barry, maybe? Barry I, I'll take a quick shot. That's the first time I've heard that question, actually, in K. Um, so they're trying to future-proof the installation by coming up with a um, dedicated, like a level two, that they start off with level one. Probably, I would say that that's probably unnecessary. I think, um, again, you should be looking at these clusters as allocating resources between the two and not one in lieu of the other. Um, and so I think there's I think there's probably the need to allocate panel space for the different breaker sizes, you know, relevant to the level one and level one and level two. But I don't think I'd be thinking in terms of you know splitting the breaker at some point down the line. Um, these are not uh, you know uh, high amperage uh, typically types of appliances where you know a commercial panel is going to run into size issues uh, very frequently. Yeah, it's Jeff. I would probably add, uh, I mean, I echo the same points. I think it's more about the panel is going to be there, which is uh, at a cost. And so you might as well build the panel, for example, to hold the future capability. I would say if you want to run level one from the panel down to some simple outlets, that's fine. But you would probably need to at least have room in the panel and a way to access it with, with additional future electric for, for a level two if that's the choice. So I think it's more about that infrastructure rather than changing. Because the outlets that you put in at a level one uh, would, would are, are convenience outlets. They could be used for other things within the space uh, you know, or easily removed or, or kept as a combination where you have a, a, a really a combination of both having right. the electrical source and the panel there. Good stuff. Right, right. Okay, great. Um, I did want to say there were three or four other questions related to grants. So I'd love to wrap up um, with Christine. If you're still on the line, Christine, to give a summary of, of all of the wonderful opportunities businesses have to avail themselves of help from your department. Sure, I can do that. So um, we have at MassDEP, we have two grants both under the name of Massachusetts Electric Vehicle Incentive Program. Today we were mostly talking about the workplace charging grant. Those are open to all employers with, with 15 or more employees, public, private. Um, you, don't, you don't need to be a, a muni or a um, state fleet. On the um, Massachusetts Electric Vehicle Incentive Program, um, the state fleet program, those, those um, programs are only open to the state fleet and municipalities and then driving schools, state, university. oh, state universities, excuse me, state universities and colleges. So um, we do not fund private uh, entities through Mass EV fleets program. And then I would be remiss not to mention the more EV program, which is a consumer rebate that is administered by the Department of Energy Resources for consumer rebates when they purchase a, a plug-in vehicle, both battery electric and plug-in hybrid. So um, that, that's the quick overview, and we're open for business, and we encourage people to apply. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank everybody. Yes, thank you all very much for being on the call today. We really appreciate your time. Um, just want to let you know uh, a link to a recording of this webinar is going to be sent out in the next couple of days, so check your inboxes for that. So if you want to share this with other folks who couldn't be on the call today and they want to watch it later, um, that should be possible probably in the next couple of days.
so thank you all very much for attending.